St. Louis, everybody up on their feet. When play resumes, it will be a free kick New York. Boy, you gotta love this building. I have a feeling that uh, I need to get a thesaurus so that I can keep up with the superlatives because it has met every expectation of all the fans here in St. Louis and we hope all of you at home Looks like Cooch is all right. Dorico will take the kick in. I don't remember seeing Megalutas almost the whole fourth quarter. 48 seconds left. Cooch to the corner for Jungle. Plays it off the board. St. Louis clears it back for Slobo Ilyevsky. Out for Glavin. 38 seconds left. New York takes it away. Alberto for Jungle. Here it is. Jungle. Goal! Unbelievable, with 30 seconds left, Steve Jungle somehow got free. Arrows six, steamers five. The only goal of the fourth quarter comes with 30 seconds left, and you can see that Steve Jungle is absolutely exhausted. Welcome to Good Seats Still Available. A curious little podcast devoted to exploring what used to be in professional sports. Here's your host, Tim Hanlon. Hello, hello, everybody. How's it going? My name is Tim Hanlon, and it's good seats still available. Yes, the curious little podcast that is, of course, devoted to what used to be in professional sports. I uh, cannot thank you enough uh, for finding us in the uh, myriad of choices that you have available to you. Uh, in the realm of podcasts, and uh, we are honored and humbled uh, by your attention this week to uh, hopefully a fun conversation with a return visitor. It's been about two years or so since Michael Lewis, the uh, esteemed uh, soccer journalist of uh, many, many years and many, many leagues and many, many stories and teams and all that kind of stuff, returns uh, to the big show for uh, an interesting little conversation uh, around indoor soccer, we uh, used the uh, the news nugget from uh, about a week or two ago of the seemingly now uh, rekindled, not rekindled, it's been around for a while, but uh, I guess re-energized, at least uh, by the uh, by the news uh, of uh, three uh, hallowed uh, members, I guess, of the indoor soccer community, legends all, uh, joining uh, in senior level capacities, the currently existing Major Arena Soccer League, or MASL. Former podcast uh, guest J.P. Della Camera uh, uh, stepping in as uh, the sort of head of media and, uh, and operations on that front. Uh, and two folks that we'd love to have on this show, and we continue to uh, pursue them, Keith Tozer, uh, well-known and, and uh, regarded uh, player and certainly coach uh, of uh, zillions of, it seems, uh, indoor soccer teams, including this uh, futsal thing that uh, we uh, talk about once in a while. Uh, he's basically going to be kind of the, the chief operating officer of this, uh, of this new improved MASL. And of course, another guy we'd love to have on the show, Shep Messing, a legendary figure on a number of different soccer fronts. He, uh, but obviously perhaps maybe being the um, most uh, consequential uh, convert, shall we say, back in the days when this indoor soccer thing was, uh, not necessarily fully legit in uh, certain soccer circles, but uh, basically being uh, the biggest name up until that point in 1978, 79, uh, throwing his uh, lot into this New York Arrows franchise in the MISL. Uh, he's uh, stepping into the uh, into the void of the MASL. And uh, I think he's, I don't know, it's some senior level co- uh, chairman of some sort or whatever. I'm not quite sure what the titles are for all these guys, but uh, no, make no mistake, uh, Messers, uh, Della Camera, Tozer, and Messing, uh, adding a, a boatload of weight, shall we say, to uh, this uh, still, you know, fledgling MASL. And and I think all of them to a person, I don't want to speak for them, but uh, would love to see uh, sort of a, um, uh, I guess, uh, sort of a going to the next level, let's call it that, of the current indoor soccer product. Uh, that exists, which is pretty good at times and, and clearly uh, includes 
uh, some of the names, at least, and some of the borrowed histories of, of things like the San Diego Soccers and the uh, Kansas City Comets uh, uh, and, and other teams and the leagues uh, and the names of those teams. The Rochester Lancers uh, are is part of the MASL as well, even though they never really played in the indoor circuit, save for a few tournaments in the old NASL. Uh, regardless, I think all of those guys and frankly, a lot of uh, sports fans, especially those with long memories of the, say, original major indoor soccer league, uh, would love to see some return to some level of that sort of top tier professionalism and or excitement that was the early MISL. Uh, and uh, those those guys, are sure, I'm sure, are trying their very darndest uh, to kind of elevate it to that. And that's going to mean money, right? Uh, getting mo- more money for players uh, and uh, promotion and uh, higher level facilities and all that kind of stuff. And frankly, giving soccer players uh, another option than, say, uh, the outdoor uh, leagues that we uh, we enjoy today, MLS and USL and, and all those kinds of things. So uh, a lot of work lies ahead, but uh, we thought it'd be a great excuse to kind of go back in time a little bit to some of the uh, uh, more fond memories, I guess, of uh, of the original sort of go round of of indoor soccer. And Michael, uh, the uh, self appointed and and and, and uh, understandably so zealig uh, of soccer reporters, uh, had uh, a, a nice little uh, article uh, on his uh, his website, uh, which uh, is a, a must read for soccer fans out there. Frontrowsoccer.com. Uh, the article uh, was, uh, it's called, off, uh, well, the, the, the uh, category is called Offside Remarks, but one writer's 25 most memorable indoor soccer games. And that's the topic this week. We're going to get into uh, sort of a nice little um, pastiche, shall we say, of uh, the original sort of professional indoor soccer mania that was the late 70s, certainly the 1980s, a bulk of the 1990s, and, and then uh, uh, a bit of choppiness uh, in between now and what exists today in the MASL. Uh, but uh, one of those uh, great games, absolutely on the list, don't mean to sort of uh, uh, give it away, was that clip that you heard, sir, there at the top. That's the uh, legendary dulcet tones of Al Troutwig, uh, ably assisted by our former podcast guest, Kyle Rowe Jr., at the microphones of the old USA cable network. Well, that was still the USA network is still around today, but a shell, arguably, of its former self. Back when it was fledgling and had live sports, the MISL was uh, one of the uh, crackling leagues uh, and the action sort of r- running across your uh, your cabled uh, television screens. And that was uh, from the uh, 1982 final that year. Excuse me, 19, well, let's say it's the 1981 final. The 1980-81 major indoor soccer league season Finale. There you go. The third season of the MISL and uh, a, a the final game, the championship game at the Checker Dome, a jam packed 17,206 uh, and arguably maybe uh, another thousand or so uh, somehow unofficially jam packed into there. Uh, it was Bedlam as the New York Arrows with about 30 seconds left in the game. Steve Jungle, of course, the Lord of all, all indoors, logically. Scoring the the what ultimately became the winning goal against the St. Louis Steamers for a final six to five score, and uh, cementing the Arrows' third consecutive major indoor soccer league championship. Now you got to remember that this 1980-81 season and the 1981 championship uh, scenario was uh, a unique format that was never sort of duplicated. It was. Uh, what they sort of did was create a uh, sort of an NCAA basketball like final four kind of thing at hosted at the Checker Dome. And you have to remember the uh, 1980-81 season was uh, the breakout uh, year of the St. Louis Steamers. They were leading the league and frankly leading, uh, I think, a couple of NBA and NHL franchises with the highest average home attendance of any indoor American sport. Right. Not just indoor soccer. Uh, but the Checker Dome was routinely packed with uh, rabid fans for the St. Louis Steamers. And uh, it was uh, sort of a final four semifinal doubleheader two days before this final that you just heard on March 27th. Uh, the Arrows dispatched the Baltimore Blast 10 to 1 on the 27th. But uh, it was also a very memorable game that was played next, where St. Louis and Wichita battled to a 7 7 tie in the other semifinal. Uh, and uh, went to a shootout, a rare occurrence in major indoor soccer league uh, uh, history. 
and St. Louis won that shootout three to one. And Wichita had been up in that uh, in that game uh, late in the third quarter. I want to say it was like seven to three or seven to two, something like that, or six to two, something like that. And St. Louis had come back literally in the fourth quarter with just a, a goal after goal after. Uh, unanswered goal to tie it. As a matter of fact, there were a number of fans in in the, in the Checker Dome that were basically leaving the game uh, amidst the fourth quarter, thinking that the game was pretty much out of hand. And uh, in classic major indoor soccer league uh, fashion, uh, the the uh, Steamers stormed back uh, to tie it, go into uh, overtime, which uh, was uh, frenetic. Uh, but alas, did not uh, yield a, a tie-breaking goal, and it went to a shootout. It was just madness, a, a total madness-filled weekend. And those two games, that 27th semifinal game between Wichita and St. Louis and the final game between the Arrows uh, emerging victorious over the Steamers uh, from the 1981 uh, championship series, or uh, uh, if you will, tournament, uh, are two of the 25 games and matches that we're going to talk to with our guest this week, Michael Lewis. And it's not just the MISL. There's the uh, the uh, the NASL indoor uh, attempts, various they uh, being. Uh, we get into the American Indoor Soccer Association, which was the uh, uh, minor league, if you will, to the uh, the latter day MISL, which itself then became the National Professional Soccer League, the second branding of that. Uh, and uh, essentially became the replacement for the MISL. We even get into the Extreme Soccer League and a team called the New Jersey Ironmen. If you remember them, Tony Miola being part of them in, in the uh, then brand new uh, Prudential Center in Newark. We get into all kinds of stuff and leagues around indoor soccer in this conversation. It's fun. It's a great callback. And uh, we uh, encourage you to listen. Uh, and Michael is, like I said before, the, not only the zealot of soccer, but there's probably not a, a major soccer event that uh, he has not covered over the last, I don't know, 35, 40 years of his professional career. And again, frontrowsoccer.com, uh, you can see all of it and then some and ongoing, by the way, and not just indoor soccer, but outdoor too. Great conversation coming up in a couple of moments. A couple of uh, promotional notes. Let's get these out of the way, shall we? Why don't we celebrate the major indoor soccer league and indoor soccer in general uh, with two great sponsors of ours, uh, one relatively uh, long uh, lasting and another one relatively new. So OldSchoolShirts.com, that's the one that's sort of from the uh, the earliest days of this show. OldSchoolShirts.com, promo code good seats for 10% off all of your purchases. Great uh, shirts from lots of different leagues and sports and, and other pop culture uh, elements too, restaurants and bars and radio stations and stuff. But a wonderful uh, two pages uh, deep, uh, collection of major indoor soccer league shirts, uh, including some of the most uh, you know hard to find or uh, head scratchingly uh, difficult to remember teams like the sh the one year Chicago Horizons. Uh, you might remember, for example, the Hartford Hellions. Uh, perhaps you may have uh, forgotten the San Francisco Fog, or maybe the one year Kobo Arena playing Detroit Lightning. Uh, all of those teams uh, and more, the uh, the beloved by me, at least, uh, New Jersey Rockets, the Houston Summit, or uh, known as the Houston Summit Soccer, I believe, back in the day, even the Cincinnati Kids, all of those teams and more uh, are there in beautiful uh, crafted uh, T-shirt form at OldSchoolShirts.com, promo code GOODSEATS for 10% off all of your purchases. And how about one of our newest sponsors, our pals at Extra Time Vintage. Dot com extra time vintage dot com code there for you is good seats that's our pal Kevin Schultz uh in the metropolitan I want to say Louisville Kentucky area if I'm not mistaken no but Cincinnati I think it's Cincinnati area as well Florence Kentucky but that's that's uh, Metro Cincinnati uh, extra time vintage dot com and fantastic shirts there but you're gonna find not only stuff from the MISL but stuff from the old continental indoor soccer league let's say the Cincinnati stingers uh, were, is burnished uh, in your memory. Do you remember, for example, um, I don't know, let's see, how about the uh, the Phoenix Pride? The Phoenix Pride of uh, the uh, major indoor soccer league. And they, of course, were the team that sort of came after uh, the Phoenix Infernos of the MISL. That's there for you, too. How about the Canton Invaders of the American Indoor Soccer Association, which then then became the National Professional Soccer League. So we get into all of those uh, uh, teams and stuff there. Uh, it's, it's great stuff there for you. And it's not to T-shirts, but you can get those logos on 
uh, long sleeve uh, shirts or hoodies or mugs, uh, all of them there uh, for you there at extra time vintage dot com code for you there promo code good seats and that's 10 percent off all of the purchases there so check them out old school shirts.com promo code good seats for 10 percent off and extra time vintage.com for uh, promo code good seats for 10 percent of all the purchases there let's celebrate shall we the wonderful pro- uh, professional sport known as indoor soccer uh both of the past through those great sites and uh, we also get into uh, not only the memories with our conversation with Michael coming up right now, but we also get into his thoughts about where the MASL goes now that these uh, three uh, legends of the indoor game uh, are bringing their uh, executive talents uh, to the current league. So uh, stay tuned for all of that and more. Here it is, our chat with Michael Lewis, a return visit. Two years now it's been. Here's our conversation. Please enjoy. For those of you uh, who uh, don't know uh, Michael Lewis's uh, uh, soccer writings uh, over the years, shame on you. But once you are over that shame and embarrassment, frontrowsoccer.com is probably the best locus for all of that stuff. Uh, Mike, you'll see Michael's writings and have seen Michael's writings all over the place in lots of different places as well. But that's sort of the hub. And there was a piece that uh, he wrote coming off of a news event, which I'll talk about in a second, on June 3rd. Um, for his Offsides Remarks column. Um, and uh, it's it's titled One Writer's 25 Most Memorable Indoor Soccer Games. And the reason why I thought that was it was fantastic uh, to uh, and timed, well-timed, uh, was because of this announcement uh, a couple weeks back now uh, of this uh, still alive uh, major arena soccer league, which for those uh, indoor soccer fans of the past and the original MISL and NASL Indoor and that kind of stuff, uh, the quote unquote good old days or maybe the, the halcyon, uh, you know, sort of uh, professional days of, of indoor soccer when it really kind of got coalesced. Um, uh, three uh, well-known names in soccer circles, one of whom has been on this show, uh, J.P. Della Camera, a well-known broadcaster and, and enthusiast uh, of the game on all different levels, but longtime believer and, and broadcaster of, of indoor games uh, in particular. Uh, Shep Messing, uh, who we've been dying to get on this show, uh, we get this close and then something pops up and, and we can't seem to sort of close the deal. But we're, we're, we're hopeful and maybe now there's more of a reason. And another guy that we uh, uh, admittedly have not reached out to uh, but want to because his name keeps popping up uh, as a seminal uh, personality on all facets of this game, uh, Keith Tozer, all three of those gentlemen. Uh, were announced as, I I don't know, Michael, you might know what they're officially known as, but uh, being more officially related to this, uh, I wouldn't call it still fledgling. I mean, it's sort of been, you know, fumfering along for a bunch of years, trying to keep the game going with some some names and heritage teams and stuff. But, you know, I think the major arena soccer league uh, now admits, frankly, that, you know, it's it was it's not the good old MISL days. And maybe there's some, another level to get to in that by bringing these three guys on in some form of capacity, uh, maybe indeed the time is to kind of get it to indeed, maybe if it's not approaching the old MISL level, maybe at least sort of expanding its presence and or ramping up its, um, uh, its, uh, its uh, quality. And then some, um, maybe you can give a little, a uh, little background on those three guys and, and this MASL thing, uh, over the last couple of years before we get into the meat and potatoes. Yeah, sure. Um, uh, Keith Tozer, uh, longtime coach, futsal um, coach, national team coach, uh, probably has forgotten more about futsal than most of us will ever know, uh, is the commissioner of the league. So he'll be doing the day-to-day um, player end of things. Um, Shep Messing, as you mentioned, uh, is the um, chairman, and um, I'm more or less, I guess, he's in, in, in charge of getting s- new owners, sponsorships, that sort of thing. But given his name and reputation, um, I think he'll be like a magnet. And if you ever have Shep on this podcast, you might have to do uh, multiple hours, maybe several um, parts to it, because he's got incredible stories to tell. I've told them all at one time or another he might conjure up a few others that we don't know about and then like you said jp della camera uh, a legendary 
um, TV uh, announcer who has covered many uh, a soccer event, um, historic soccer event, you name it, he was there. I think, uh, I don't know if this will be an insult to him, but he's almost like the zealot of uh, TV soccer, of American TV soccer in this country, maybe even more so than me. I think he's been to 15 World Cups. I've been only to, only in quotes, 13. No, I'm not in a race. I'm pretty... I'm 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 pretty happy with the the number of events I've covered. I think it's a privilege when you cover a big time event. But I I'm digressing there. Um, these gentlemen have has seen it all in indoor soccer. Um, they've you could say done it all. Uh, they've gotten various honors, Hall of Fame honors, and you, you have to figure if these this trio. If they can't pull it off, you just wonder who can to bring the MASL to another level. I mean, uh, don't get me wrong, the owners and, and, and management have done a fantastic job of keeping the league around after all these years. But um, I think there is a, you know, a, a place for uh, indoor soccer in this country. And we're going to see over the next year, two years, three years, um, how well um, this triumvirate of, of uh of men uh, can push it up to that, boost it up to that next level. Yeah, and look, so, so things certainly have changed, you know, in the sports landscape, television, uh, media, social media, all kinds of stuff. Soccer specific uh, stadiums, outdoors, and the and the stability, if you will, of, of MLS. But also, as we sort of referenced before, too, uh, in other conversations, there's almost been sort of a boomlet, if you will, of construction around, uh, shall we call them, right sized arenas. Uh, for the game, I wouldn't call them necessarily soccer specific for indoor soccer, but maybe soccer uh, perfect for indoor soccer with, you know, maybe five to eight thousand seats versus, you know, 16 to 22, like for NHL and NBA. Doesn't mean that they couldn't coexist, but, um, you know, they're more midsize arenas that arguably could make the indoor soccer game uh, independent, if you will, or non-dependent on sort of the big leases and the, you know, and the third or fourth uh, shake of calendar dates, which we've seen in, in, in previous MISL indoor soccer conversations, uh, has been one of the issues that, uh, you know, has undermined uh, its long-term success over time. I'm sure the MASL uh, has experienced some of that too, where they've shared uh, facilities with, say, minor league hockey or uh, you know, G League basketball or whatever teams. No, definitely. And uh, yes, uh, it, it kind of reminded me of, you know, Major League Soccer began in football stadiums, American gridiron football stadiums, uh, cavernous. Uh, yes, the crowds early on were were pretty decent. There's sometimes they got sellouts in 50, 60, 70,000 seat stadiums, but when the league came back down to earth later in its inaugural season in 1996 and years after that, uh, they weren't filling up the stadium. So the next best thing uh, for so many reasons was to call their own stadium home and have uh, soccer specific stadiums that hold 20, 25,000, 27,000 that will create a, an atmosphere. You don't need 50,000 people to do that. There are exceptions like Seattle and Atlanta, of course. And I think using that template, uh, indoor soccer in some places can thrive. There will be others back in its heyday. If memory serves me correctly, the St. Louis steamers had sellouts on a regular basis or near sellouts at the Checker Dome, and we're talking 13,000, 14,000 on a regular basis. A unique situation there. And there were some other teams in the original MISL that did well as well, too. But I think, uh, you know, looking at smaller arenas, nothing wrong with that, especially if the team grows and you're selling it out and maybe there's a larger arena nearby that's priceable. I don't know if that's a word. It is now. Um, or within the team's price range, budget range, um, maybe they go to that originally. But uh, I think it's a great idea. All right. Well, let's let's uh, dig into some of some of the sort of um, uh, and look. I I think a lot of people, uh, you know, look at the indoor game as unique uh, 
uh, exciting, a little bit more, shall we say, Americanized. And and uh, I think the aficionados, uh, that, that's a nice way of saying people have been around and, and saw the original leagues, if you will, NASL Indoor and MISL, uh, would. And yes, there's some tributaries there, too. So that don't don't the Twitter land. Don't sort of jump on me by saying, oh, well, those weren't the originals. I, I know that. But but they were certainly the ones that sort of commercialized them to a great extent. Um, there's almost, I think, uh, among that crowd, a sort of a, um, a, a gauzy, uh, 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 I don't know, uh, 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 dreamlike sort of uh, remembrance of just how good and electric and exciting that, uh, that version of the indoor game was, uh, only aided and abetted by YouTube. Um, and I think maybe the best example is actually, and I don't want to sort of uh, kind of undercut your article here, but the, the number one... A uh, game that you sort of have in your top 25 memories of, of things you covered and remember uh, is probably a great place to start, actually. And, and I think by many accounts, it was uh, not only the perhaps best and most exciting game of the MISL's uh, brief existence, but what was at stake. Um, I remember as a kid watching this game, I'll let you set it up, but it was sort of a, the fir- only year that the MISL did this, was the third year of its existence, they had basically kind of like a Final Four format of the playoffs, uh, like NCAA basketball, in St. Louis, the aforementioned Checker Dome, uh, St. Louis Arena, packed to the gills because the steamers were absolutely something. And it was a semifinal match between the um, uh, St. Louis steamers um, and, uh, the Wichita wings, I think that just, uh, you know, was, uh, it, it had everything, including a shootout of all things well, or overtime, I forget. Um, but if you had never seen an MISL indoor game before, and you happen to be lucky enough to be watching it on the USA cable network, I mean, I just remember it was, I, I, I couldn't, I, I almost, I couldn't believe I I wanted to jump into the TV set. That's how exciting it was. You know, when the fourth quarter started, it, um, you know, Wichita has a six to one lead, and that's a pretty formidable lead in any type of soccer. Um, I don't care who you're playing against. And then slowly but surely, St. Louis came back and uh, eventually tied it at seven seven. And I can't tell you. (laughs) <laughs> who scored what goals or whatever. But I do remember that the Budweiser theme song was being played every time the steamers scored a goal in that period. Now, listen, we're in St. Louis. It's Budweiser beer. St. Louis, it's one of their, it's their big sponsor. And that, that's what I, that's just drilled into my brain forever. Um, besides that incredible comeback, um, you got to give that team so much credit because a five, like I said, a five goal deficit. And even though you're playing at home in front of a packed house, your fans are crazy. Um, that's very, very difficult uh, to do. Uh, Don Ebert uh, scored the equalizer with 69 seconds remaining. Don Ebert had been drafted by the uh, the Cosmos a couple of years, the New York Cosmos, the outdoor New York Cosmos, a couple of years before. Um, and this was in the days when players were playing indoors and outdoors. Um, and uh, the place just went nuts. And, you know, at that juncture, you just figured, okay, wh- how and when are they going to, to, to win this game? And one thing that I love about Covering professional sports, no matter what level, whether it's youth, youth, college, amateur, semi-pro, indoor, outdoor, women's, um, World Cup, you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know who's going to be the hero or heroine. And um, uh, a reserve forward for the St. Louis Steamers, Emilio John, who played in only two shifts the entire game, and that was in the final and fourth quarter, converts the game-winning shootout and gives uh, them an, uh, the home side a, 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 an 8-7 win. Now, who would have predicted him to be the hero after just playing, what, a, a couple minutes on the field? But that's what 
we love about sports, just that one moment for that unlikely hero. Of course, there was a bigger story, that incredible comeback, uh, which uh, to me is the greatest comeback I have ever covered. There have probably been some fantastic comebacks in all the other sports, maybe that surplant this, but for indoor soccer, um, it does not get any better than this. Yeah, it was a real showcase. And again, I'm surprised that the league, so this is the third year of, of its existence. This was March 27th, 1981. And um, the the first semifinal was uh, the Arrows, the Mighty Arrows, the two-time then champion MISL Arrows, uh, just pasted Baltimore 10-1. to And then there was the second game and it, it, the shootout, which was a fair, a very, uh, it was a rarity in MISL games. Uh, very rarely did games evolve past a sudden death uh, overtime to go to a shootout. So it, this was a game that was just absolutely insane. And Lord knows we've had a couple of conversations um, with uh, 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 Mike Romalis and Tim O'Brien who uh, and Adam Knapp, the three of them actually put together this uh, great Wichita Wings documentary, uh, God Save the Wings. If you haven't seen that, our audience, I highly recommend you search and find that one because that game that the steamers ultimately prevailed in uh that semifinal game to go into the final which by the way the final two days later against the mighty arrows wasn't a bad game by itself either a one game a one goal affair that the steamers uh lost out at home jam-packed arena um th that game that the the semifinal game in many respects to wings fans still defines their memories today it sears in their brains about arguably in their minds how that game kind of got away and what could have been different had they been the ones to play the Arrows in that third ever MISL final. It's funny you mentioned that. I, I've spoken to some Wings, former Wings players over the years at the North American Soccer League um, reunion in 2018. I wound up talking to uh, Roy Turner there and uh, mentioned that and he said oh you have to bring that up thank you very much i mean he said it very very nicely but um and we talked about uh, indoor soccer and the wings and the wings were a very good team they just weren't a very great team uh because you had the arrows you had the steamers you had the baltimore blast in the early years and a lot of very good teams sometimes get buried in history just because they weren't great enough. I won't say good enough. They were they were good, very good, but not great. And um, yeah, if if they do make it to the final, you don't know what's going to happen. Maybe they um, maybe they w win win the entire thing. And if they don't, they still reach the final, which is still a big deal. Well, let's talk about the arrows generally because there are a couple of other memories that that pockmark your uh, your top twenty five. And we're not going to get to all of them. I just I just want to sort of elicit. It some of the stories and the generalities here. But, um, you know, I, I think when when uh, people of today's um, uh, understanding or, or what we now guess, guess sports historians or people looking back to this crazy league that existed. And by the way, there's a documentary in there somewhere. I'm still waiting for the, you know, the, the really high level once in a lifetime type documentary for the MISL. Um, but uh, and I, I'm sure it'll happen in our lifetimes. I'm pretty sure. Um but the arrows, you know, people people look at the history and they say, "Oh, the San Diego Soccers." Well, they were just they were it. That was it, right? And I think I, I they're this, the current version of the Soccers are going back in time uh, with uh, sort of a Twitter uh, reminiscence of their various championships. But but people may forget, frankly, that the very first four years of this MISL, starting in 1978, uh, was dominated by this team called the New York Arrows. They won four consecutive. MISL champions uh, championships. And of course, a quick parenthetical, we are, you know, on a sort of mini crusade to find out where those championship banners might live. Nobody seems to know. Uh, Shep has uh, said on Twitter uh, that he thinks that they're they're lost to history. Some people think they're in a box somewhere and discoverable. Some people think that they're lost forever. They were tossed during some kind of construction thing. I don't know. I, ho I hope that there's at least one of those still out there. But talk to me about these arrows and maybe some of the various hijinks that they found themselves in, because they were a juggernaut as this thing was getting going. Well, first of all, I should give you just a little background of why I cover the arrows. When I say cover it, I'll, I'll explain. I worked at the Rochester Democrat and Chronicle, 
covered a team in the NASL called the Rochester Lanterns, which we uh, talked about forever in the uh, in the first time I was on the podcast. Um, just so happened, the coach of the Rochester Lancers, Don Dragon Popovich, Dragon is his given name, wound up being the coach of the uh, Arrows and used many Rochester Lancer players um, on the Arrows. Um, Arrows played on Long Island. I come from Long Island, so it definitely gave me an excuse to visit my folks at the time and and when I wasn't in Rochester. And we also called the Arrows the Lancers winter team uh, in our paper. But I also uh, somehow convinced our sports editor um, to, to cover the Arrows on a regular basis um, just to, you know, several paragraphs uh, when they played uh, the first year. And then when the Buffalo Stallions came in, I wound up covering the Stallions. And obviously when the Arrows played in Buffalo, I covered those incredible games, which were, were which was like wars at times. But I had, I just wanted to give you a background. How in the hell does someone from Rochester cover a team from Long Island? I wish I could say I covered all their games, but yes, they, they were a juggernaut, um, the incomparable Steve Jungle was the the head of things on the field. Um, obvious, the obvious, um, fantastic nickname, the Lord of All Indoors, um, because he could score at such a prolific rate. And you know, I, I've seen him score goals, you know, twice within thirty seconds, three times within two or three minutes, turn the game upside down. Um, not you know, not every outdoor player can make the transition to an indoor game. Uh, it, you've got to obviously think fast, maybe think faster or fastest. You've got to have the skills, being able to play in smaller quarters. Uh, speed goes a long way, and a soccer IQ as well too. And Zungel had all of that, and um, a pretty healthy ego too. That doesn't hurt. I think probably all goal scorers have it. It just depends on how high it is. Of course, as we all know, no team is a one-man or one-woman show, and he had such a supporting cast. Uh, Bronco Segoda, uh, Canadian, 17-year-old Canadian, came up as a rookie. I think he left high school uh, before he graduated to play with the Arrows. Um, he was more like his um, prodigy, uh, Zungle's prodigy. Um he had a booming shot indoors and outdoors. I think probably his first few years, he relied on his athleticism and, and his his shot, and he learned the game and became one of the great all-time indoor players. I think he had something like a 20-year career indoors and outdoors, and more indoors than out than outside. Um, and they added uh, other key players, um, Jim Pollahan, who wound up scoring the first um, goal in MISL history, a very good def defender for the for the Arrows and Lancers, uh, former U.S. international, uh, left back. Um, sh the aforementioned Shep Messing, who backstopped uh, the Arrows' first four uh, championship seasons. Uh, eventually, uh, the, the, the team added Fred Gurev, who actually led the league in scoring the first year because Jungle did not play uh, enough games to catch Freddie G, as Fred Gurev was called. But uh, uh, Fred Gurev maybe was relegated to the Arrows' second line when he joined the team. But that's one hell of a second line when you have him. Uh, you don't give the uh, opposition any respite at all. And you add uh, Louis Alberto, who I think might have been the most underrated player in the league. Uh, might not have gotten a lot of assists, but he is helped set up so many goals, maybe with a lead pass that wound up to some to another player who then uh, sent it to um, Freddie G, Steve Jungle, or Bronco Segoda. Uh, you put all these players together, and they played as a team. Uh, it's one thing to have star players. It's another thing to have them play as a team. And these Arrow teams weren't just championship teams they would run over the opposition many a time they would finish with winning 75 80 percent of their regular season games 
yes, they were mortal. They did lose. They lost on the road. And even once in a while, they lost at home. Um, the unfortunate thing of, about all this is, um, well, they played at the Nassau Coliseum. Um, at the same time, the New York Islanders were catching fire. Um, Islanders uh, wound up winning four Stanley Cups in I think they started their run in the middle of when the Arrows were, were, were doing it. Uh, but unfortunately for the Arrows, they could never really sell out the Coliseum or even get close to it on a regular basis. And that ironically turned into their eventual downfall and, um, and, and sale of the team. Uh, but what a juggernaut they did have in those early years. And um, I feel privileged uh, to have the opportunity to watch them play live on TV when when it was on cable up in Rochester um, and um, some great memories from it. Yeah, um, it's also uh, 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 interesting, too, because uh, I, I think, you know, not only did that that team was a, a juggernaut, but it was also um, you know, really in some respects almost kind of solidifying what the game actually um, kind of meant too, right? Because I think people were at least certainly for that first season, kind of just feeling their way through as as the rules kind of gelled and people got got used to it. I mean, you make a, an allusion to uh, the arrows, at least in their first sort of couple of years or iterations, uh, were kind of the um, uh, winter version, if you will, of the Lancers. Uh, Houston did that their first year, that what was known as Houston Summit Soccer. Talk about an unoriginal name being named after the arena and, and not to, uh, but they were basically masquerading as the, uh, the indoor version of the then NASL Houston hurricane. Um, I, you know, it's just interesting, I think too, because uh, it does bring up this, the NASL and outdoors, right? Uh, and I'm sure that first season or two, when the MISL came onto the scene, uh, I guess there wasn't any real sort of official rule preventing perhaps that uh, you know, restraint of trade, right? I, if I'm a player, I want to play indoors and this thing's going to pay me to play indoors as well. And why not? Right. Um, but uh, let me use that as the excuse, I guess, to bring up uh, this other version of indoor, which was the NASL, which uh, in many respects, right, was really the originator of the modern version of the indoor game, not the MISL, Uh now, we've had some folks talk about that and the origin story of that and the, the Adams of the NASL playing a couple of indoor games against uh, uh, Spartak Moscow in, in, in Philadelphia in 74. Um, but I think people very much forget that the North American Soccer League was experimenting, if you will, with this sort of indoor thing. I think they called it Sock Hawk back in the early 70s. And here was this MISL later in the decade kind of bringing it to a league. I, I think the... I think the NASL was kind of nonplussed that that their quote unquote idea had been, if you will, kind of stolen away from them. Well, you're absolutely right about uh, hock sock or sock hock. Uh, I'm trying to remember which word yeah, goes I first. I, but... Sorry, I forgot. I apologize. No, that's okay. No, I, I I'm trying to to remember myself. Um, they had a tournament in St. Louis, a preseason tournament there. Uh, before uh, in 1971, February, March of 1971, um, this is before I started covering soccer, but um, I did some research about this years ago. Um, the St. The St. Louis Stars were there. The Dallas Tornado were there. Uh, the Rochester Lancers were there as well too. And there was a fourth team that I can't remember. I don't know if it was the Kansas City Spurs. No, they went out of business, but but uh, and it, but they thought it was very successful, and the league, the NASL, wanted to start an indoor league. And actually, it seemed like every year there was talk about them start wanting to start this league, and for whatever reason, they didn't do it. Um, they had a, a, a league-wide indoor tournament over the winter of 1975, uh, which they got all the... Um, outdoor teams to play in regional tournaments. And then they had a, uh, uh, a national uh, tournament final four. They did that in 1976 as well. It, it just seemed like they were ready, always ready to, to start that indoor league. And then Earl Foreman, Ed Tepper, 
uh, beat them to the punch. Instead of talking about it, they instead of just talking about it, they they pulled it off. Um, and let's face it, it's not easy. I don't care what sport it is. It's not easy to start a league from scratch. Um, but, the, you know, you talked about outdoor players getting a chance to play indoors. And some excelled and some didn't. Um, and some got burned out, unfortunately. But, yes, it, it gave many of these players and American players who were not being play, paid very well an opportunity to earn more money. Granted, in those days, the an NASL season might have lasted from, what, April through the end of August, if you include the playoffs. So you had a longer period of an off season. Um, it, you could make a, a real good case that it will playing indoors all that time will keep you in shape, no doubt about it. But like I said, it will give those players an opportunity to earn more money. And I know for a fact that there were several Rochester Lancer players that were in 1977, 78, earning three, four, five thousand dollars a year. And I don't know how in the hell they got by. Well, I did know some went on unemployment. Some still maybe lived with their parents. But when indoor came, it was a lifeline. And, um, you know, and I've always been, you know, a, a player's writer because they're all about the game and. Thank heaven that they had an opportunity to um, uh, to, con- to, to continue playing. And I'll use, if I'm allowed to ramble on here, I'll use one example of indoor soccer saving a career of a player, Dave Sarakin. And here we go again. He was on the Rochester Lancers. Um, it's 1976-77. He had an opportunity to, to play indoors for several years before he went into coaching. Yes, this is the same Dave Sarakin who uh, coached the U.S. national team for, what, 14 months um, before they named, let's say, Greg Berhalter as a permanent coach in, what, 2019, I believe. Same Dave Sarakin who was Bruce Arena's first lieutenant associate coach with the L.A. Galaxy for so many championship teams. And when Bruce Arena coached the U.S. national team on uh, during two tenures. So we're talking about this indoor league saving a career. You know, I don't think Dave Sarakin would have remained in soccer or the like. I shouldn't say it like that. The likelihood of him remaining in soccer might not have been as great. So I'm using him as one example. But uh, and Dave today uh, he recently uh, coached uh, the Puerto Rico national team during World Cup qualifying. Sorry for the long-winded answer there. No, but but it, it speaks to um, uh, the contribution of the indoor game uh, and uh, how, uh, you know, I, Precky, another great example later on, right? Uh, you could make the argument that uh, that he was not only saved, if you will, but it made and improved his game once he sort of came back to outdoor uh, on the even on the international side of things, oh, you know, definitely. That's a, with all deference to Dave, um, that's a better example. Of, you know, for for a player um, because he was impactful in in both sports in, in in both leagues. I mean, he was an MVP in MLS, if my memory serves me correctly, and uh, an impact player for the national team. Um, in his later years, uh, but uh, you know, players have to uh, uh, during those years had to do whatever they had to do to, to survive because they enjoyed playing the game so much. Maybe some of the players didn't have anything else to do, particularly without an outdoor league. The NESL went out of business in 1985. MLS did not come into existence officially until 1996. 11 years is a long time, and a lot of players uh, played indoor soccer um, and, again, went on to either front office positions in the game or coaching positions and um, extended their career. And like you said, Precky uh, might be the finest example. Yeah, um, it's it's interesting, too, the, that first tournament that uh, neither of us was present at in 1971, right? It's just is dripping with irony when you look back on it, because uh, who was, uh, you know, I think the the fourth team was the Washington Darts, which, 
you know, I think I think people also don't remember that in 1971, the outdoor or the NASL was basically on life support. It was only five teams and four of them were competing in this little indoor tournament. Uh, and it was, if in some respects, almost keeping this league alive, too, because it kept the players, you know, around and it kind of kept the, the sport a little bit visible in the off season. But Don Popovich scored uh, a bunch of St. Louis's goals for the start. Ironic. The tournament was in St. Louis Arena, which was where we started our conversation, right? So it's really, really interesting. And it's just the NASL, you know, had something there and they never really kind of got with it until Ed Tepper and Earl Foreman and and and, and friends kind of put their heads together. Um, and um, Joe Matchnick, too, on the rules side, uh, to put, put it all together into something uh, unique special, separate, different, and focused on only this indoor version of the game, not sort of this dalliance that I guess kind of saddled the NASL, even when that league decided to finally kind of jump in on a couple of occasions to go head-to-head with the MISL. They never really kind of sort of achieved sort of that level of of hotness, I guess, that the MISL did, although there were certainly pockets, the Chicago Sting the soccers, you know, when they decided that no matter where the soccers went, they seemed to kind of show that outdoor, quote unquote, could play indoor. Um, but, you know, the MISL was the pure version of the thing. Uh, no doubt about it. They were the uh, hot commodity. Um, they had the best indoor players or players who would outdoor players who adapted to the indoor game. Um, and, you know, they, they did it with style, pizzazz. And you have to give the MISL, a lot of credit for, for uh, something that they added to sports, too, pre-game introductions. Um, you know, these some of these were elaborate. I remember uh, being at a Baltimore Blast game, and the Blast came out of this makeshift rocket ship with smoke and lights um, and with music. I, I don't remember the music, but it was this whole giant extravaganza before the game which got the crowd going. It, yeah, this is not traditional soccer as we know it, but it, it uh, definitely pumped up the crowd, and they had some sizable crowds there in the Civic Center in Baltimore. Um, I remember at New York Arrows, the, at least the games that I went to at the Nassau Coliseum, uh, maybe more subdued, uh, but everyone had their own way of, of presenting things. I remember when they introduced the Arrows, they used the um, theme song, um, the main theme song from the movie Superman uh, that appeared in, what, 1978, 79, with spotlights on the players when they were being um, introduced. Obviously, these are the Supermen of indoor soccer. But every team had their own unique way of introducing their players to the to the crowd, and um, it got in many cases it got the crowd revved up, and that's what they wanted to do. And a lot of teams, maybe all of them, um, played music during the game, too. Uh, probably catchy rock and roll music um, might not be people style today, because I think a, a lot of outdoor people kind of like just watching the game itself. But again, it was part of the extravaganza of of indoor soccer. Um, I have to admit, I'm trying to remember if I went to any NASL indoor games uh, beyond the ones that I did in the early years, 1975-76. So I can't tell you what they had for their introduction, their pregame ceremonies. But indoor soccer, you knew that every team had its own unique way of saying, here we are for tonight's game. Oh yeah, and, and the and the NASL teams certainly did sort of borrow very heavily on those theatrics as well. I mean, there's no question that the MISL was ahead of its time, not only for the sport of indoor, but but just uh, sports generally. Right now, is just assumed that that the entertainment is is part of the show. Um, at, the, at the time, you know, late '70s, early '80s, that was almost looked upon as being uh, you know pro wrestling like in terms of its gaucheness, but. Uh, but so let's talk about there is a seminal game, though, that's also on your list that uh, I think it, it warrants a little attention that uh, it seems to sort of radiate uh, importance uh, as well as it being a very uh, interesting and memorable game. 
And that was the All-Star Game, the second version of that in the MISL in 1981, uh, specifically, uniquely, and um, on purpose, played in uh, what is uh, not so modestly referred to by the ownership as the world's most famous arena, Madison Square Garden. Uh, what do you remember about that All-Star Game that, of course, yours truly was at as well? Uh, and and I'll get into maybe a little extra little bonus that we've also talked about on this show as to who was in the crowd that day that sort of birthed something else, too. Ah, uh, I know. Oh, it would be interesting. Well, yeah, at the time, uh, MISL was, you could say, at its early peak. Um, they wanted to expand, and one of the potential places was Madison Square Garden. And you might say, wait a minute, now you have a team – you know, in New York already. Yeah, well, Long Island and Manhattan could be like two different countries. Um, you know, they're so far apart in so many different ways. So at the time, M MISL was hoping to, to get a team in the garden. And, you know, there were there were a lot of obstacles. Obviously, you had uh, two teams playing there already, and they always had the uh, first and second picks of playing dates. And of course, it it ain't inexpensive to play at the Garden. But going to, to that All-Star game, you know, the Eastern Division had a bench like you oh, you wouldn't believe, a team like you wouldn't believe. You know, you had the, the New York Arrows, Steve's Jungle. Ah, oh, you know, you, uh, Bronco Sagoda, um, Dave, uh, Dave David DeRico, who was a national team player outdoors for a number of years, um, and so many uh, so many others, um, and even though the Arrows dominated the, that Eastern Division team, it was the hardworking, uh, blue collar Western Division side that won the game, uh, eight to five. Uh, Adrian Brooks scored two goals. Paul Kitson had a goal. Um, you know, it stunned the East. Everyone thought, you know, as the game progressed, sooner or later, Jungle's going to break out or they're going to do this or they're going to do that. But because the Arrows up until that point had won, uh, you're talking about the first um, two titles running away uh, with the with the Eastern Division at the time, everyone thought, okay, East is going to have no problems. But uh, the West reminded them that, hey, you just don't throw your soccer boots out onto the field. You have to go out and play. And um, and they did. It, 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 it. And again, this is why I know it's only an all-star game. All-star games in the long run don't mean that much. But it was a lesson, I think, <laughs> for any young soccer player that no matter how good you are, You've got to put in the work. Well, it was certainly also d doubling or tripling as a showcase, right? Uh, the league was trying to expand, you said. I mean, we've had some very interesting conversations about, say, the L.A. Lasers in the, in the years to follow. Jerry Buss, right, in his major arena in the in the form of the Forum. Um, you know, a, a Madison Square Garden, you know, people sort of take notice, right? I, I, you know, you look at, you know, a a, a, a a venerable, shall we say, stadium in uh, in Buffalo at the time or in Baltimore at the time. OK, and, they, you know, those are also smaller markets. But when you're in the, you know, the biggest market in the you know, in the country, you know, this is this is this this is a signal that something uh, is interesting, at least if it's for one game only. But it's, it's also interesting, too, because it, it, it drew attention. Right. Which in the media center of the of the universe uh, is important. And, and the thing I was hinting at, well, a couple of things happened to that one. I think uh, an indirect, um, although it was probably in motion around before February 11th, 1981, when that All-Star game was played, uh, there was an expansion into the uh, brand spank and new nearby across the river, uh, Brendan Byrne uh, Meadowlands Arena in the, in the form of the New Jersey Rockets. Now, itself a lamentable topic because, especially for me as a former mostly season ticket holder uh, for that not even one season but it, it did kind of if you will regionalize it and make the sport at least attractive uh to maybe the broader metropolitan area of new york beyond just long island to your point i remember growing up in northern new jersey and going to a couple of arrows games and that that was a that was a schlep right and um but you know it also uh 
uh, it was also an embarrassment of riches in, in, in the fall of 81 because you also had the New York Cosmos playing their NASL version indoors. So for a brief moment in time, yours truly was just uh, lapping it up because we had two directly combative teams in different leagues playing indoor games to the detriment ultimately of both. Uh, but it was sure as hell fun while it lasted. But but here's the kicker. Um, and I don't, I don't know if you know this, but we've had uh, the Arena Football League was actually birthed during that MISL indoor game. We we had the founder of that league, Jim Foster, on our show. Fantastic episode if, if folks out there have not heard it. It's a two-parter. Um, he was in the in the stands at that game at Madison Square Garden basically with – paper and pen in hand. He was he was then an executive of the NFL. And he came up with the idea for arena football at that game. He just sketched it out as he was watching that indoor soccer game. So it really interesting in how oddly influential that particular game was, not just in soccer and MISL, but also broadly beyond it. You know, we get inspiration from so many different ways. I have a <laughs> – I walk around with a pad in my house because sometimes – I might get a great idea and I'd rather write it down on paper than uh, put it on my phone and maybe forget where I put it on my phone. But, um, you know, and sometimes, you know, you get an idea from, from some, some place else. And uh, that, that, that's a story that I have to admit, I did not know until you just told it. And I think that's great because like I said, you get inspiration from so many different places. Uh, before I forget, by the way, one thing about that all-star game, and you had mentioned the the man already, uh, Dr. Joe Matchnik. Um, I I did a story about Joe a few, several years ago. Um, you know, uh, I think he's done just about everything in soccer you could imagine, and obviously he's um, Dr. Joe on 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 Fox for their uh, for their soccer coverage. Um, he grew up uh, as a big time uh, New York Rangers fan saw the team play at the uh, old garden for so many years and uh, eventually the new garden. And it was a obvious big deal for him to, to work the middle as a referee in that all-star game. Um, we all have dreams, even referees. And, um, um, and that's just one part of, um, uh, Dr. Joe's incredible career, which is still going on. I hope to, <laughs> I just hope to be uh, active in some way, shape or form in the media at his age. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and it's so, all right. So we talked a lot about the MISL. We've talked about a bit about NASL games and that kind of stuff. But I, before we wrap, I want to kind of get into maybe a little of the uh, after effects, the uh, sort of diaspora that sort of came uh, and some of the games and, and notables sort of after the sort of MISL or then by that time, by early 1990s, MSL sort of evaporated into the oblivion because you had this American Indoor Soccer Association now then becoming the reincarnated, if you will, by name at least, NPSL, National Professional Soccer League. Uh, that was clearly uh, some fun and and uh, quality play as well in the wake of what used to be the MISL. And you even have something from... Uh, a brief adventure known as the Extreme Soccer League with a one Tony Miola that I think people absolutely forget. Maybe you can kind of uh, regale with a couple of memories from from both of those uh, situations. Okay, the Extreme Soccer League will be, at a, even though it was fairly recent, uh, did not go to as many games, but uh, let me uh, do the NPSL. You know, I think a lot of people saw it uh, as, let's say, a, a minor league um, to the MISL, I think any player or coach who uh, worked the NPSL would claim otherwise. They felt it was equal, and uh, and it became the only indoor soccer league in this country um, after the MISL um, uh, went belly up after the 1992 season. They had some uh, very good players as well, too. Very good, excellent coaches. Keith Keith Tozer coached the uh, Louisville team, uh, Louisville Thunder, in, in, that, in, in that league. And eventually, um, well, he eventually finished with 700 wins, which I believe is the most by any indoor coach, which is a ridiculous amount. Um, and, you know, the NPSL gave 
again, a lot of players an opportunity to play where they weren't, they couldn't play um, outdoor soccer, or particularly without now the NASL or the MISL. And um, they might not have always been in the biggest markets around, but um, and, uh, but they got some excellent followings. If uh, I have to admit, I did not cover a lot of those games. One of, I had the opportunity to, to cover uh, the Harrisburg Heat. I always look to do different stories. Uh, this is back in 1992. I was the editor of Soccer Week, a publication out on Long Island. Um, and I wanted to go out on a road trip with the team. Jim Pollahan, who I mentioned before, is the first um, – player to score an MISL goal, former Rochester Lancer, who I knew, was the coach of the Harrisburg Heat. There were several players from Long Island on the team. I asked them if I, if, I, asked them if I could go on the, the road trip with them. Three games and three nights. Pretty grueling. Um, and, and indicative, by the way, of that sort of, yeah. of the play, right? This was not the MISL reincarnated. Remember, the AISA was created during the MISL's run almost as a second as a perceived second division almost feeder league and that's what the MPSL grew out of and then all of a sudden they were it and and so but you're still describing a a, a less than glamorous life on the road right yes and um and, and it was you know I wound up getting to know some of the players and I will mention at least one of them uh in, in a minute or so um uh, and they played in, you know, got to remember this now, Canton, Day- Canton, Ohio, Dayton, Ohio, and I'm and Detroit. And they won Friday night, Saturday night, and Sunday night. They became the first NPSL team to ever sweep on the road. It's not easy to, <laughs> it's not easy to win on the road, let alone winning all three games. Um, the, the team was joking that they wanted me to go on every road trip with them afterwards. And I said, I'm sorry, I got a day job to do. But I had a lot of fun writing this humongous road trip story. And obviously it was helped with the fact that the team had won. So obviously there were very good vibes on the bus coming and going to games and obviously during games. The next year I did a, a sequel, not as not as sexy. I spent an entire weekend with them at home. And for their two home games at the um, Farm Show Arena in Harrisburg, um, got a chance to uh, to meet this uh, player there by the name of Mark Polisic. Um, happens to be the father of this Christian Polisic. I don't know if you ever heard of him. I heard he's a pretty good player. Yeah, playing overseas somewhere in England. No, seriously, I think we all know who I'm talking about. And um, Mark Polisic. Um, Good soccer player, and actually, I covered him when he was a teenager in, in, a, in a state cup in a state cup game in New York. I wound up doing some stories about him, um, kept in touch over the years, and um, you just don't know who you're going to meet through the years and um, what maybe indoor soccer meant to Mark Polisic for him to become a coach, for him to take his son. Um, who obviously had many natural gifts, but obviously his son was raised in a great soccer environment. And we won't go into Christian's background, but I think you know what I'm getting at. Um, so indirectly, NPSL has, has an effect on U.S. soccer history. Granted, I understand it didn't make Christian Polisic, but there were seeds planted I hope I'm not going off the deep end on that. <laughs> no, it makes it makes it yeah, absolutely. And and look, all these not not absolutely. You're 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 totally within the the, the boundaries of our uh, of our exploration here because there, we we've seen this time and time again, right? I, we, on the backs of uh, of pioneers or the early uh, uh, you know uh, uh, seed uh, layers, if you will, uh, you know, comes unexpected uh uh you know roots and uh and stories that come out of it. let me let me ask you this um the your memories of the mpsl and then i guess the sort of tony miola uh, experiment with the 
uh, very short-lived extreme soccer league. Um, what was that like? What What were your memories of the quality of play and the, I don't know, the day-to-day nature of, of that, given what we at all had seen on a much more, I would argue, higher pedestal, perhaps quality of play, certainly in terms of of fan interest and, and televised coverage of what was the MISL and to a lesser extent the NASL before it. I think in many respects, people would have said or maybe remembered that it was this was a bit of a come down, perhaps, from that sort of white hotness that the early part of the 80s kind of uh, saw with indoor. Yeah, I think they were trying to catch lightning in a bottle again. Obviously, having someone like a Tony Miola certainly couldn't hurt. But that's just one player. I think you need uh, a player who will... Um, Cause excitement, excite the crowd. Um, with all due respect to goalkeepers, and they do take their bumps in so many different ways, particularly indoors, you probably need someone or several players who um, will fill the net and maybe do it in style. And the quality of play from what I remember of this league, even though it was only 13, 14 years ago, it's not that far away, but you know, was was pretty decent, but um, maybe a wrong place at the wrong time. Um, I'm, I have to admit, I am not an expert on why the league um, went under. Um, I thought there might be, uh, as I think I said before, a, a niche for this sport. But uh, unfortunately, it didn't have the legs for more than a, just a couple seasons. So, yeah, this the thing, the Extreme Soccer League also, I think, had the benefit in um, uh, you recount, I think it was entry number 18 in your list of, uh, of I think, the original first game of the New Jersey Ironman of the Extreme Soccer League. No E, by the way, just the X stream. Um, I think it was also, uh, well, Pele was there, right? They're pulling out all the stops to kick out the first ball. Uh, but it was also, I think, the first year, maybe even one of the first events in the history of the Prudential Center in Newark, this then sparkling and gleaming, still quite a an impressive facility. So that, that the the novelty, I think, of that perhaps had something uh, to do with it, and, and a relatively large crowd. I, I I guess so. Given all that, and then we've seen sort of the rise or or the the rebirth, if you will, of um, uh, a reincarnated or at least borrowed name of of the second version of the MISL, and and now this MASL thing. Um, maybe I'll just wrap up with sort of this general sort of softball question. Um, given, uh, you know, and you just hinted at it, right? So uh, bring, having a name like a Tony Miola, having, uh, you know, uh, a name like Shep Messing when the arrows floundered and, and went away and and the idea of reincarnating another team in the form of the New York Express, which didn't last a season. But but no, there, there was a star there, right? It, it's a time-honed sort of, tradition to kind of use that sort of as the ultimate sort of promotional vehicle. Now you've got these three guys, especially in soccer circles, very well known, maybe Shep even more so because of his outsized personality, just generally beyond the sport. But you've got these three guys in JP and Keith and Ann and Shep uh, now essentially lending their name and soccer creds uh, to this MASL, which has you know, on occasion had its little sparkles of, of interest, right? Landon Donovan suiting up for the San Diego team and, uh, you know, some of the teams uh, hearkening back to their original incarnations and, and borrowing those those heritages and the heritages in the form of, say, the, the Kansas City Comets and, um, and the like. Um, what do you think uh, as we stand and have this conversation in – June of 2021, where do you think the MA, the MASL uh, stands in terms of its uh, opportunity in front of it? I mean, it's a much more complex sports landscape now, both positively and negatively, a lot more competition, a lot more uh, challenges to get that sort of discretionary dollar. We're coming off of a pandemic, for God's sakes. We have this futsal league that Keith was actually involved with, or at least his, lent his name to a few years ago with Mark Cuban. Nothing's come of that. Um, do, do we think yet we've got, you know, lots of television, lots of streaming video, and the G League is a thing now with the, with the NBA, and, and 
minor league uh, sports seems to be still flourishing to a minute. Where do you think this maybe reincarnated MASL or, or rejuvenated could go? Uh, do you think it has a shot at more stability, more growth, and maybe even, dare I say, getting to some of the, you know, the superlatives that we just talked about in, in the old MISL again? Or is that ship passed? Well, reaching what the MISL had, the original MISL had, is, would be probably difficult. Is it a goal? Yes, but I wouldn't make it uh, the overnight goal because I think things have to be built slowly but surely. I just use it. Major League Soccer as an example, which almost went out of business after the 2001 season. And now look how many franchises there are around the country. And it's still growing and it still has room to grow. And that's an, another podcast and a half in the future. Saying all of that about the MI, MASL, I have to make sure I get all my uh, letters correct, the alphabet soup of all these leagues. Um there is, I think, room for growth if it is done properly. I, I don't think people should expect anything fantastic overnight. I mean, the bottom line, it always comes down to money. And what I mean by that is um, money by the owners, sponsorship, and obviously getting on TV Um and maybe not necessarily getting a lucrative contract because we all know how difficult it has been for the MLS uh, uh, to pull that off um, over the years. But I think to get on TV somewhere, to have every game streamed as some a part of a special service just from the media end of things um, – but they're going to have to bring in some sponsors to pick up the cost of upgrading the league, the league office, that sort of thing. And any new owners they bring in, they're going to need to have maybe deeper pockets and or maybe have bring in co-owners for some of the, uh, the teams that are still around if they want to raise the level of their game. What I mean by that is quality players paying the players more. Um, and I, I can't, you know, the, the, the salaries in this league range, I can't tell you that. Um, I'm not that familiar with them. What I'm getting at is it's a balancing act. Uh, you can't throw all the money in that first year. I think you've got to literally plant the seed, water it, and watch it grow. Of course, this first year, there will be a big boost because – the presence of these three gentlemen, Keith Tozer, Shep Messing, and J.P. Della Camera, it will it has already sparked interest, and I think it will bring a certain amount of money in. How much? I, I yeah, I don't know, but I think it's going to give the the league a higher profile in so many different ways. Um, like I said, reaching for the stars like the original MISL, um, that's unfair for that league um, to say they want to to reach that right now. Perhaps someday, moving up um, the ladder, maybe getting close to it. But I think, like I said, a lot of things, yeah, it's a balancing act and a lot of things have to go right. Um, but I think they could revive the league um, to, a, uh, to a higher level. Um, will, will it be as popular as outdoor soccer, probably not. But then again, I've been surprised in the past. Yeah, I look and, and as a, as a coda to that, I you know, um, yeah, I think you could look at it through the lens of history, and you know, uh, gee, wouldn't it be great to see that back again, and 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 you get all excited about that, just like people got excited two weeks ago as we record this, uh, the supposed return of the United States USFL Football League, right? Uh, which really is just been so far a press release uh, about this thing called the Spring League, which is, exists now uh, and seems as of now pretty much just a crass uh, uh, promotional move to kind of just borrow 
and trademark some of the old team names and slap them onto the whatever exists today. That said, though, I think there is I, I think one thing Major League Soccer begrudgingly has learned uh, is that there is uh, marketing and um, uh, credibility and authenticity to be found in what used to be right, which is uh, arguably right up our alley. Right. But, you know, the the credit to uh, the current MLS teams in Seattle, in Vancouver, in Portland for uh, going early into the old names that worked back in the NASL, perhaps uniquely and and sticking to their guns as to why that was an important name and branding exercise. Um, you wonder if this MASL might, and perhaps in the form of these three guys, uh, want to tap into that too. I mean, let you know. I, I'll put a finer point on it, Michael, and you could probably appreciate this. You know, the MISL isn't even the, in the friggin' National Soccer Hall of Fame, right? It's, it's, it doesn't exist in their minds, and there are reasons for that, I guess, politically and otherwise. But you know, where I come from, just the old average armchair historian and and you know, it, rapidly aging fan of your right the. Uh, I, I, I didn't dream this stuff. I saw these games too. And there was, and we've just talked about how foundational this has been either directly in the case of a Precky or indirectly in the case of a Christian Pulisic, you know, it, it was, it's part of the history of the game. Right. And if this is going to be, if you will, rehabbed and or, uh, taken to another level, it seems to me that this odd, but memorable, and, and in some cases, very rich and robust uh, branches of history from the old NASL indoor stuff and, and certainly the MISL originally formed could actually be a, a really, you know, underlying piece of what might make this, you know, uh, catal uh, catalyzed uh, MISL uh, go going forward. It might be something in the past that could help the future. No, I agree. You know, uh, I'm a traditionalist. I kind of like seeing teams staying around for many, many years. I wince every time a team, particularly a soccer team, goes out of business after a few years. Um, and what I'm getting at is I like the idea that MLS teams, as you mentioned, the Sounders, the Timbers, the Whitecaps, um, used uh, t you know, name, team names from – the NESL days. I, I, I like that. I like that tradition, even though it's different owners, a different era, different generation, generations. Um, but I like that. And I know he, I live here on Long Island and people are, would love to see the New York Arrows return, at least in name. I mean. And banners, those four championship banners. Yeah. <laughs> We've got yes, to find definitely. those. But, you know, uh, yeah, I, I think Taking a little from the past isn't a bad idea by any means. I mean, if they um, if they have a team in Pittsburgh, maybe it's the uh, they revive the Pittsburgh spirit. I know there's a Washington spirit in the National Women's Soccer League, but if there's a maybe a team in Hartford, it's the Hartford Hellions. Uh, maybe not, but uh, you know what I'm getting at is <laughs> that I I I I I I like going old school when it's appropriate. And uh, using that in, in strategic in, in areas, you know, strategically, what might work in New York might not work in Hartford or St. Louis or, or Los Angeles or vice versa. But whatever, you know, uh, get someone who knows something about marketing and see what the best route is in terms of branding or rebranding a team. Yeah. And I'm not saying let's go back to the old, you know, and because it, 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 it was perfect. I, I'm just saying. It's the word I keep coming back to is authenticity because it, it gives people, especially if a new generation who think this is all sort of brand new or a bastardization of the now more popular outdoor game, um, some sense that they're that they're that, that this has been around for some time, extending all the way back into at least the early 70s, at least in its modern form. And that might give people more pause to think, hey, you know what? There is skill involved in this and this is worthwhile and worthy and not a degradation of the game and that kind of stuff. And that's only found in, in what used to be. And 
Lord knows, I think the average soccer fan doesn't even know or remember half the teams you just mentioned. And the he- Hartford Hellions are absolutely worth remembering. Buffalo Stallions, too, for that matter. I just remembered it because of the conversation we're having. You stirred some memories back there. Something hidden in my brain somewhere about the uh, Hartford Hellions. Uh, haven't heard them for a number of years, but it's, um, you know. The, the name again, was better than the team. I think most people would agree. Yes, you're absolutely right. I think the Arrows, when they uh, played them, they I'm not saying they chucked up a W, but they said, oh, how many goals is Steve Jungle going to get tonight? Or can he break the all-time scoring record or whatever? But seriously, um, like I said, uh, not every every city or region needs to to go back and take the old names. Like I said, I think it depends on what works in terms of branding uh, because – that's that's an important thing. You want to get get it right. You only have that that famous saying. You only have one time to make that first impression. So you want to get it right. If if they do go that route, my my gut feeling is the league will expand. But will this new league will expand? But it and I think it might go to larger uh, some larger cities here or there. But again, I think it will do slowly. My gut feeling, no inside information on that, by the way. Well, uh, look, we'd love to get Shep on to talk about uh, the future as well as the past. We want to obviously reach out to Keith Tozer and see if he wants to regale us with some memories like the L.A. Lasers, for example, and and that kind of stuff. Uh, And now here's your chance to promote. Um, Where can people find uh, your stuff and and what are you working on now and uh, what keeps you busy and and what are you looking forward to soccer-wise in particular? Okay. Uh, okay. Let's see. Um, uh, I have a website, frontrowsoccer.com, front row soccer, as it says, um, covers the New York area, but national team internationally when, when appropriate. Um, when I say national team, national teams, um, you could, uh, my Twitter uh, handle is Soccer writer at it is so, at soccer writer. I don't know how I got it. How fortunate I was. Um, it was available in two thousand and nine, and sometimes you don't argue with luck. I am <laughs> very close to uh, completing uh, the, the editing of a of my book about the Rochester Lancers, a team, my first soccer team that I covered. Oh, you, some, bur- you buried the lead, Michael. Tell us. Well, I wanted to just say the permanent, uh, the, 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 the things that I'm doing on a day-to-day basis before I get to, to my baby. Um, uh, it's the title, is the, uh, it's called Incredible, but uh, it's called Alive and Kicking, The Incredible But True Story of the Rochester Lancers. Um, they were in the NASL for 14, well, they were all around for 14 years and in the NASL for 11 years. Um, when everyone looks back at the NASL, uh, they think of the Cosmos. And uh, listen, the Cosmos had some of the greatest, uh, maybe all of the greatest stars uh, uh, on the planet during that time. Um, Pelé, Beckenbauer, Carlos Alberto, Giorgio Canaglia. But the Lancers are another story. Maybe there were more teams in the United States at the time, some in the NASL, maybe in in the old American soccer league that uh, had more modest budgets, had grand goals, but uh, didn't have as much money to spend. And the Lancers were a community owned team. Um, They won the North American soccer league championship in 1970, but um, they had some intriguing adventures. They lived in interesting times as that old uh, saying goes. And, um, I, this is a project I've been wanting to do for years. I've been working on this for years. It literally chronicles the entire history of the team. Uh, I write, write, write about every game in it. Um, my wife, who's who's done the editing of it, she says it's more interesting about what happens between the games than the games themselves. And as I like to say, well, the the games put things into proper context on why things happen between the games. But um, 
I think it tells a story about uh, U.S. soccer because a lot of um, names that actually we talked about today are in the book. Maybe not heavily, but Shep Messing played a season with the Rochester Lancers in 1979. But I think it's a story about American soccer during those years and the struggle uh, that a lot of players had at the time. Um, and, um, you know, uh, I hope to have, I hope to have it out by the end of the summer, um, keeping my fingers crossed. That's great. Yeah. There, there's so much, there's a lot of pivots to there. There's, there's, there's the ASL and how that saved the NASL. There's the, 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 the green Bay of the North American soccer league. The, there's the sort of unwritten sort of history of, of that. There wouldn't be really no New York arrows without the Lancers. Right. Uh, all of that, right? Uh, the the uh, uh, the the Serbian, uh, Croatian, uh, uh, whatever the boundaries are this week, right? Uh, uh, contributions to the sport uh, in the United States and and as a world power, all that stuff. Yeah, it's great. You know, I learned. You know, I'll say this about soccer in general and the Lancers specifically. I learned so much about the world covering soccer for obvious reasons, just from the nationalities that have come over here over the years and talking to players, getting to them, to know them for feature stories. As much as I've written hundreds, maybe over, or maybe thousands of games, my favorite stories have been about the players, about the personalities, why they've come over here, why they did this. Um, you know, like you said, Serbian versus Croatian. I didn't know what was happening over in Europe until I had to cover a Rochester Lancer Toronto Metro's Croatia game, and I got a um, a quick history in in history of World War II and beyond, and uh, it was amazing and stunning uh, what what transpired on and off the field. How much some of those players hated one another, and some actually got along as as brothers as well too. Go figure, but. That's human nature, I guess. But um, the book, like I said, is, is it, it tells it tells the, the story of, of uh, American soccer as it was from 1967 to 1980. The a roller coaster ride for the team um, when they did go out of business during the 1980 season when they were having trouble. I was dying inside because I knew I I was watching a beat go by. Um, uh, and I enjoyed covering the game of soccer. I had learned to, uh, I had learned to, to love the game by then, um, the game itself beyond the personalities, but, um, to find out all these other stories, the details, um, people will have to buy the book. I'm sorry. You'll have, you'll have, uh, ho like I said, hopefully by the, by the end of the summer, it'll be available. <laughs> All right, many, many thanks to the Zelig of soccer writers, Michael Lewis. You can uh, follow and uh, enjoy Michael's writings uh, of soccer, both past and present, at his website, frontrowsoccer.com. Lots of great stuff there, including the article that we uh, refer to uh, uh, regularly in this conversation, One Writer's 25 Most Memorable Indoor Soccer Games. You'll see all the entire list there. And the rationale behind his choices, even the ones we didn't talk about. Uh, you can follow Michael on Twitter at Soccer Writer, at Soccer Writer, all one word. Uh, and uh, something to look forward to uh, and almost uh, virtually guaranteeing a return visit. Uh, I don't know, six months from now, we'll see when. The uh, book that Michael is uh, just about completed, and hopefully we'll get out there in publishing land sooner rather than later. It's the his history of the Rochester Lancers. I think it's called Alive and Kicking, incredible but true story of the Rochester Lancers. Talk about a uh, uh, an important and underestimated uh, and uh, long forgotten franchise in, in American soccer history, many, many different levels as to why the Rochester Lancers uh, were uh, an important franchise, at least in their previous and earliest incarnation. I know they do exist now as an indoor team in the MASL, and I believe there's a Lady Lancers team uh, part of uh, the uh, second division women's uh, uh, league setup as well. But uh, that should be a fascinating ride 
Uh, and we look forward to having Michael back for hopefully the promotional tour uh, of that book as well. Uh, let's see if you want to follow our doings, by all means, we're uh, all over social media. We'd like to uh, post lots of different sort of photos and teasers uh, for each week's episode. Uh, follow us on Twitter. Why don't you at Good Seats Still? Follow us on Instagram at Good Seats Still Available. Please follow us on uh, Facebook if you'd like. We're at uh, Good Seats Still Available there as well. Want to send us some email? We'd love to hear from you. Hello at GoodSeatsStillAvailable.com. That's the email address. Go right ahead. Uh, and uh, all the other stuff uh, that uh, we don't have time to mention, you can find on our website at GoodSeatsStillAvailable.com. Yeah, that's where you can sign up for our weekly email newsletter. You can see all of our old episodes and all the episodes to come. Lots of great imagery there. All the links to uh, all the great books and stuff by our various authors or or films by our documentarians or whatever merchandise. Uh, it's the locus for everything about this show and hopefully more to come and be back filled with lots more goodies and stuff for a return visit. So bookmark it and, uh, and uh, come visit early and often. Why don't you? And uh, we look forward to seeing you next week. Uh, but before we do that, we want to say thank you, of course, to our pal, Jerry Payne, Jerry Payne, audio excellence. Thank you. Great and kind, sir, for your services this week and getting our episode up and out there. And uh, we thank you, of course, for listening. We'll see you uh, and talk to you uh, again next week. Please be safe. Hope your uh, summer is uh, off to a decent start. Hope you're being safe and uh, look forward to seeing you next week. Uh, we appreciate it to no end. Take care, everybody. Bye.